Hi, and welcome to the Org Dev Podcast. So what is it like to practice organization development in a truly global organization from the Thames Estuary to West Africa to Nepal to the Indian Ocean and even Mauritius? We're absolutely delighted to be joined by Bonju Akintola today. Now, unfortunately, Bonju wasn't in Mauritius for us to conduct this interview <laughs> because we, we offered to go meet her. <laughs> So we're actually doing it from our own offices today, but um, we're actually delighted to have uh, Bonju join us. She is Senior Organisation Development Business Partner at the Zoological Society of London. It's an absolutely fascinating organisation, which is a science-driven conservation charity, really focused on creating a future where wildlife can thrive. Now, you probably know of the ZSL, as it's affectionately known, for its two zoos, London Zoo and Whipsnade as well. It was also one of the UK's leading conservation organisations. Really interestingly, science underpins all of its efforts with research informing not just its conservation work, but it also helps governments around the world set national and multinational targets to adapt their policies accordingly. And they're also at the forefront of research into zoonotic diseases that spread from wildlife to animals, as well as animal specific diseases. Now, Bonju has a wide range of skills, but describes herself as a performance and leadership coach, OD practitioner, and she's passionate about supporting individuals and organizations to excel. Part of her role is working with senior executives to crystallize their organization culture and ensure that it's evidence in the lived experience to their many employees and customers as well. Bonju has lots of experience in L&D, and prior to this, she worked at the House of Commons, where she moved from L&D and transitioned to our wonderful profession, organisation development, and she's a, a very welcome member of the community as well. She's backed by extensive professional and academic qualifications. She holds an MSc in People and Organisation Development from Roffey Park. So welcome, Bonju. It's great to have you on. So it's really lovely to have you with us. So just to get us started, just tell us a bit about your role. What does your role involve? I work as a senior organization development um, business partner, as Garina said, but along with it comes as a small organization, the training department is also part of it. My role involves so many things I could be called into EDI and work with EDI groups. So I have an opportunity to work both on the global level, um, organizational wide projects, but also support individuals and teams across L and D, OD, and all in very interesting. I find a way of bringing OD into all, looking through whatever work I'm giving through an OD lens. So interesting, excited, and very varied. So how does OD inform, you say you use that OD lens to look at the work that you do, how does that inform the work you do and the approach you take? One of the main things, especially is, is having that system thinking hard on and looking at things systemically especially in an organization like ZSL that um, we do sort of varied and different things within the small organization. So we've got, we've got an Institute, Institute of Zoology, which is affiliated to UCL, has its own complexity made, made up of researchers professor, up to professor level. Then we've got another team called the Conservation Policy Team, uh, and they deal with government relationship, policy, um, passing policies, and they have all the um, offices, international offices. We have two zoos. We've got the London Zoo and we've got the Whipsnade Zoo of zookeepers. We've got curators. We've got um, vets. We've got hospitals. So having all together is about seeing the link and how do we stay as one organization? The chief exec uses the term one ZSL. And so with that in my head, what does that look like? What does that mean? Looking at OD and looking at it as a system, as one system, for seeing how do we ensure the connectivity? How do we have one culture? How do we reduce a silo working and be able to um, and, and be able to work together towards that vision we all have and passion, which is a world where wildlife thrives. What do people get wrong when they think about your organisation, when they think about ZSL? What might surprise them? The same thing that surprised me when I got the job, when I applied for the job, because all I had in my head was London Zoo. Not in my wildest dream did I think uh, in a day I was having a chat with HR managers in Thailand uh, and trying to figure out the training needs in, in Nepal about uh, and, and you know and then working with professors who were like oh my god so it's the same thing people assume that you come when you come of ZSL all they think is about the zoo but it's got so many fascinating bits about it that except you get in or you're interested in conservation you wouldn't know about the different things that we do so it sounds like there's no 
shortage of challenges oh, of no, things to no. get your teeth every, into. Every, yeah, yeah. Every day is a new thing. And how do you prioritise where you where you focus your energies with kind of with so much to to look at? Your my personal drive, which is I want to help everybody. I want all of them are interesting. All of them are exciting. All of them are juicy for 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 change when you want to do, and to look at the fact that you have limited resources. So sometimes is to look at the time frame or the impact it will have. It, that itself is not even easy, but uh, I have a wonderful direct, my director of HR, uh, people and culture that I report to, is a very good sounding board. So sometimes it's specific with that and say, all these are coming to me, all these are coming at me. And to decide, say, but this is what I think is priority and be able to, uh, you know, see what can, using the metric, what's important, what's important, what's urgent, but also to work with somebody and find what can wait? But while waiting, what can I, with, while waiting, not making them see as if I've ignored them or I don't think their challenge is important. What does small, you know, like small uh, solutions I can put in place? What could be an email I could check? What could I bring? Something to hold the space and hold the interest and the respect while I while I get others. So uh, while I go into more challenging things. So. Yeah. So sometimes it might be what is more, I will focus, it might not be an organizational wide thing, but it might be challenging a team that has a tendency of, of blowing out of proportion or getting into deeper problem. So yeah, I have to weigh which one has the greatest impact by time. Something that Danny and I were talking about with another couple of clients we've got is where you've got an organization where you've got people that have very different professional identities that they come together under one roof. So, mm-hmm. you know, as you're describing there, you've got scientists, you've got vets, you've got administrative stuff, and they all come together. And, and I guess what you're describing is a really great thing. There's a there's a higher context that binds us together, mm-hmm. but we still have to get on operationally. What What is the role of OD in helping those different kind of uh, professions get on together and helping them communicate one good example is so we just i just launched a six months leadership program um even though for now we're doing the uk and then next year we're going to extend it to the directors um in the international office and the orientation so is six months modular but this this first which was this month the orientation one of the things we're encouraging which is new is was so uncomfortable is for people to drop their title and like and, and and come as me. And so we did a lifeline and, and they did their lifeline and they had to discuss a lifeline, a professor discussing his lifeline with the head of commercial. And feedback I'm hearing from the directors that they were saying, what was that? Because that wasn't what they told they were coming for a training. And that's one of the ways to help people to say that uh, preaching, you know, that the organization is human rather than looking as a machine, is one of the uh, metaphor I keep trying to build into people's thinking because everyone's passionate about what to do and everyone assumes what to do is more important or more urgent or more linked to you know, the, the vision than the other. So the first thing is about looking at us as humans and, and also helping us understand our, our, our culture. What does, does culture mean? How we do things here, and so how can we do things in such a way that we leave our values and 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 still retain our passions and our desire, but see each other as humans and be able to work together. I found that orientation really fascinating to watch people break. It was difficult to remove themselves from their titles and and their, their jobs. So that's one of the ways we're trying to cheap out that 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 way of, way of thinking of. That's been cultural for a long time. ZSL is 200 years next year. We've done things similar for a long time. Which is a whole other range of things. There's so much tradition in there. It's yeah. like we do things the way we do. Is that something that ZSL and, and the OD function is particularly trying to do, which is like, what are the traditions that have make us strong and how do we keep up, need to update our ways of working? It's hard and sometimes it doesn't work. One of the things I enjoy about this is that agency I have to, to be able to try things out and use the wisdom to know when to pull back and say, mm, this, we're not ready for this yet. So last year, we have an annual conference, staff conference um, every January. And I thought, oh, wow, it would be a good time for me to do an, an actual research. And I thought, let's do something about, we are an organization, uh, this is a place where, and I wanted people to finish the sentence. And you know, Actual research is more like research, learning, I am, you know, and then moving on. And that's one of the ways I was trying to help us start to visualize what is our culture. And, and, and But it didn't work because 
we were ready to move around to the learning bit about it and then iterate it to another, okay, we move, to move, move forward. So that's what I believe the OD function. I've not been there too long, so the, it's, it's, it's work in progress. Obviously, you've come in from is it the House of Commons was your previous organisation. You've gone into the ZSL. How, how do you begin? Like, how do you begin the role, like understanding what needs to be done and in what order and to sequence it or even just to get to the bottom of what's actually happening here for you you've got relationship building i mean that that's just it i have no clue it was a very different world but before i got to the house of commons i was coming from ford motors so it was also a different world but if there's one thing i, I think i'm good at and i enjoy is, is getting to know people so it was about it's selling and then because i've run my own business for a while i think i'd gotten I think I've mastered the fact that no matter what is selling, I, I, we are a small organization, I produce everything, my newsletter, my, I produce everything myself. So going back to your question is about talking to the different team, talking to individuals, finding out, but with that mind about your, your, your gatherings, it's more like gathering the data needed for you to now to start recommending the needed uh, uh, um, changes or areas you know, of, of change. The first thing I was notice was that we were still using doing the PDR work was the you know the old-fashioned PDR once a year and I could say oh wow this is an opportunity for us to this is the area I could the first that was the first project I did was how do I turn it around into you know the quarterly conversations a quarterly um, um, um appraisal rather than end of year and that was Throwing, uh, just testing what I'm throwing around to people and see what do they think of it. And then got to my director and said, oh, let's run a pilot. Pilot with zookeepers to get from each team, one from each department, one team to take part. Because a pilot is an experiment, isn't it? Like you're going into an organisation, you're just learning how it works. Mm. And so rather going, right, everyone's PDR once a year is going to change. We're going to new policy as from 1st of April. You're, a pilot allows you to learn so much data. How, yeah. how open was the organisation to running things like a pilot? I think they are because they're scientists. So they're researchers. Because they're mostly researchers, I think they're used to those kind of trial and error to get things. So I think that makes it easier to know that. Yeah. And and But it's, but it's different if the pilot is something you're not really interested in or you're scared of or you're, you're suspicious of. Now what 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 do we have to change this? Especially when you think it will add more work because it had to have with month. It came with monthly one to one conversations, check ins that we weren't culturally used to. You know, the designing the uh, the structure in such a way that monthly check ins and quarterly conversations, which then are the PDR that you just it's, 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 that's where the assessment takes place. But interestingly, the pilot worked well and have regular. Um, catch up sessions with all the pilots for feedback, what's working, what's not working. And the excitement was just amazing. Amazing. We live in the, the, the team, of, some of the teams you think are, are traditionally not going to engage, like the ground team, you know, who you, you say, well, my objective is always the same. You know, I just manage the ground and getting the managers and team leaders to start to have conversation with them. And they took it and became so creative with it because um, the first feedback was they they actually changed they decided not to have the meetings in the office so they had meetings over coffee so the check-in was over coffee or the walk you know they're walking on the grounds but that because I told them look it doesn't have to be formal and not everyone has not everything has to be written and the the, the excitement at the first gathering of the, the pilot to get feedback was oh bonjour during the conversation, I found out that there was a groundsman who had a degree in zoology. We worked with this guy for several years and didn't know that personal information about him. But because there were three questions, how are you, how are you doing, how can I help, was the guiding, guidance question for any check-ins. Then they went to, so the line, man, they, and these are just team leaders, they're not even senior managers, decided to go to the vet team and say, we have a zoology graduate who's interested in just shadowing you guys. Can he come in free time and say yes? And this guy's excitement as watching the first autopsy, you know, and how it impacted his work on the ground, whereby the, the, the passion, you know, and, and the managers, the line managers of team, they're looking at the fact that I enabled this. And that's the kind of thing you start to see the shift happening 
and then people calling on you now to now start looking at things like, all right, the, you won't call it OD, but whatever area they need things to shift, to change, and they're now calling the OD team into that. So, hey, can we talk about this and stuff? And when you do a pilot, who are the best pilot participants in your perspective? Is it bringing in people to participate in it that are just really pro kind of new change? You know, they're going to be the people on board. Is it to bring in the people that are likely to be most reluctant, but might be skeptical or is it a blend of them or you know does it depend i guess we're just in this interest to hear your view it's a blend it's a blend because you need the encouragement of the people who you already know that they run within no matter what because they believe in it and if you're going to make an organizational wide intervention or change you better bring along the people who you're already are skeptical and that was what i was talking about those teams who normally wouldn't do things that because then you can foresee what's going to happen with other te- te- um, potentially um, challenging teams who are not engaged with it, but also start to use these ones who you now have brought over to the engaging side as the stories. I tell that at every launch, the new way of doing things organizational wide, using the stories to engage people, bringing these people to talk at some of my of my of my briefings, you know, asking them, you might be mentioning names and stuff. Uh, so you need both sides of those who will encourage you and be easy that will run with the vision and reduce the workload on you on their side while you focus on those that might be more challenging. We really love to ask this question. What was your journey into OD? I've unconsciously always been interested in understanding how people learn and helping people learn. And so after university back in I'm Nigerian, so I went to my first degree was in Nigeria. I can't remember if it was because I didn't have a job. I, I have a first degree in English. And, and so I, I'm going to private primary school with a dictionary and sell my skills. I'm like, hey, can I work with your teachers? And I focus on the dictionary because um, we've got mother tongue interference. I don't know if you've ever had the term mother tongue interference, whereby you're, because we have different dialects, you can hear my language, my accent, and I'm not British. And But there's some words that are, completely can't be pronounced because of the sound difference. The same way you can't call bonju the way I call bonju because GB does not exist in the phonetics of English. So the same way about some English words or, or phonetic that do not exist in Nigerian languages and help the teachers in these private, expensive private schools um, explore possibility of practicing and using phonetics, you know, the transcription, we'll call it. Um, and then going with them also, and then extending it to storytelling about working with them on how could it be more engaging, engaging storytelling skills and stuff. So that's how I started. <laughs> I, I, I started, I didn't, I didn't call it training then because I didn't know what it was. And then, well, life went on. I started getting to career. And, and then my first training job was with the Stevenage Citizen Advice Bureau. Um, and I became a, a going to training found about CIPD, did my, the first level, I think they used to call CTP, Certificate in Training Practice, um, and then moved to Cambridge, CAB as a training manager. And, but there was always a curiosity, a curiosity about why do people go on training courses, especially when it comes to customer service, all those, but they come back and there's no change. And I was always curious about what was, what was, what was missing in all this training we keep churning out, sending people on, or, or you do team bonding, people go and they do all those spaghetti and, 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 and marshmallow things and they come back to the office, they're still not talking to each other. And you spend thousands of pounds taking them on that. And then I started exploring coaching because obviously coaching has always been mentioned as one of the training methods. I decided to explore coaching more and then went to gain my qualification in performance coaching and then leadership coaching. Um, as I said, NDC became my coaching supervisor at some, at some point. And, and, and so that helps trying to see that it starts with mindsets, it starts with, self, it starts with self-reflection, it starts with having accountability. And that was what coaching could help bring that change um, and behavior and knowing that it wasn't just the training. Um, in training, we talk about 70, 20, 10, you know, that olden day principle that that really mattered. Um, and then as I started read, I reading, studying, going to webinars, I started hearing about system thinking and working with complexity. 
And that was like, oh, that, that's even deeper because, but I could always see the human angle. That, yeah, that, that relates to how people work with change or how people work out, relate at work and demonstrate behavior. So, and I, I wanted, so um, I, <laughs> I'm always going for what I like learning. I, and then I, but I wanted to get the best of the best. So I found out about Ruffy Park. And then I, yeah, so I went for my MSc in Ruffy Park in, uh, and then got the MSc in people and OD. So throughout, I found that I've been working with this principle, but not knowing it. So it was more to like, really understand it better. Um, I like working with culture and exploring when is it, how we do things here, what does that matter, living the values that we true to ourselves, living the values understanding where there's a this, this this alignment between individual values and organizational values and helping organizations realize that just writing your values down put it on the wall will not bring the the engagement or the buying and also wanting to know people might not run with it because it's counter to what my personal values uh, is or are so there yeah, that's how i started getting into this and as you know my work history so it's been from l and 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 then into into coaching to OD. Um. So you mentioned Roffey Park there. So Roffey is quite an important place for some people in the OD community. Um, how did you find that experience? How did that shape your practice? Um, it. I mean, I still have people I work with now. I call into to who are maybe that, that we did the course together. Who I've still got groups of um, because the um, approach to learning then was is self managed learning. I think that was one of the things I loved the most about it, that you could go anywhere you wanted to go. You had guiding principles, but then it wasn't modules about modules and modules. You just wrote your paper and it was also peer learning. So the fact that you're in a group of five, six um, 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 peer, peer support and you have to assess each other's paper. I think all those things, it made me look at education differently and learning differently. Um, and I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it because the only things that, yeah, there are areas of AD I'm not OD, I'm not that skilled in because I didn't explore it. But I think it at least gave me an opener to the wide, what we call the map of OD. But I like the idea that I could, I could find a niche I wanted to go into. I, I saw people go into complexity and they're really good at it now. And so when I'm working, I have like a like the leadership program I'm running, I've got someone I know because I worked with that for two years and I know she's honed this skill to come in to work in that area with the leaders and, and lead that particular model, so a module, module for, of the course. So yeah, very different, but, but I think it made it more real. The only challenge, the only sad thing was, and then because it was international, people came from, I mean, my set, in my learning set, there was somebody from Hong Kong, and then there was somebody working in, in, in Saudi Arabia. We had a French person, and then people from across the, the UK. So having that open your mind, even to see the cross-culture cross -culture awareness, people from France that were using words um, we would call derogatory here and and in all innocence just used it as a normal word and was shocked to hear that no you can't say that about black people you know and that in, in using that to build that so I see that people not everybody came out comes out intending to be rude but because they're just different so it makes you understand that so the same way me as as an immigrant can look at the can think about me not being rude but just being me I start to think about other people but it was nice to have that variety of people. But well, COVID happened and sadly we didn't get to see each other as we thought we were. When we do a master's, we put so much work into our dissertation, but then no, the world never hears about it. And I thought, what was yours on? Yeah, so mine was, um, I had an opportunity or twice I've had an opportunity to talk about it at a, at a podcast. But I was, I was, the research question is, how do we create a culture of belonging for Blacks in the workplace? So... It was not too long after the the killer of George Floyd in America, so it was quite fresh, and so there was a lot of materials. So I had such it was a wide read, but it was eye opening to me. Some of it very sad, but at least For a spoiler alert. What were your findings? What? How do you create a sense of a community of belonging? Ah, it's about inclusion, but also it's about difference, the uh, ident uh, or appreciating differences understanding that just every black person will still differ. Um, the Caribbean is different from the African. 
um, same with Asian, but they, well, the, my, as I said, mine was based focused on blacks. The findings we, we've moved, we, we've moved, come a long way, but the the belonging happens with you accepting me as I am. Uh, but that also had its own interesting twist because, as I said, it happened during COVID, and hearing people who would tell me, "I don't put my camera on," then we, you know we all went in because I don't have the the persona, the look I had in the office. And I don't want them to see me any, any differently. And that's because the wig I wear in the office, I don't want to wear it at home. So I'm taking off my wig. I don't wear my makeup. So I've got my hair. Now you put the camera on to talk to me because you see me as one, but you will not put the camera on an official setting because they already see you, your, blo- your long straight hair. And yet I would tell, I can tell the wig. Others can't tell the wig. So because of that, you won't put your camera on. So when you're talking about creating a sense of belonging, it also was, are we also putting, are we also the barrier ourselves? Are we also putting those barriers ourselves? So that was one of the things I was reflecting on. But it's about having that inclusion. But what does inclusion look like? Inclusion means not lumping me together. Inclusion means creating that safe place for me to be me. Um, I had people say that, um, they came to work wearing African patterned um, dress and they were called aside by their senior manager. This was a project manager and said, a senior manager comes up to a meeting and says, if you want to go higher in this, you better not come like this to work again. Um, and then people were saying that, right, we talk about allyship, which is one of the, one of the if you want to create that belonging, that allyship, that mentorship, that... Um, um, but allyship doesn't mean it means if you're going to mentor me and 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 you want you're talking about representation of more black people in senior positions then when i come to a meeting and you take me along to a meeting don't let me sit at the seat behind because as long as i'm sitting behind i'll always be seen as a hand and this person talked about the opportunity her, her director who was mentoring her will bring her to sit on the conference table and ask her, what do you think of that? And that's how you empower people with the confidence. And they're just saying, you can be, you deserve to be on this table. And so when the jobs kept coming, she could not apply because she's tested the water, she's tested it. And, and she said, I don't always speak rubbish. I actually have ideas. So yeah, this, I'm not opening a long while, but those are the, <laughs> the few things that come to mind now. And, and a lot of those things would be uh, potentially interpreted in different ways. Like, you know, we'll often, and you'll probably see this, like managers thinking our teams never put their cameras on. And so they attach a different story to it. All exactly. to, but, but people aren't having those conversations where they feel safe enough to, to, to explain why and, and to find a new way of being, isn't it, as well? So I'm so glad we asked that. So thank you. It sounds <laughs> fascinating, Bonjour. So one of the questions we like to ask all our guests is what does a typical day or a typical week look like for you? For me, because of, as I say, I'm like, everything is chopped into my role. We just, sometimes can be frustrating. Sometimes also, as I say, it's juicy and very depending on how much time. I'm not sure there's a typical, I have a, like a typical day. So I, a week. So, I mean, I can start a Monday and it will be like, maybe I'm having run a leadership workshop or some training workshop of a sort. And then on Tuesday, I could be sitting with conservationists and looking at our decolonization policy or work because one of the things that is still is keen on is decolonization of science which literally is saying we're changing the narrative from what's always been the where the i don't know if you heard about the white savior mentality and then we're going to do good to these people who don't know left from right and that's a that's not the best summary of, of decolonization and then we've this is what we've created what's called a fairer framework with the conservation is help and what does that look like? So Tuesday, I could be and with the steering group looking at what does decolonization look like? What does fair look like when we're in the field, working in the field? But also when in the zoos, what does it mean to be fairer, which is linked to one of our, our values, which is inclusion? That could be by Tuesday. And Wednesday, I could be working with zookeepers about the PDR system or process that's so new about how can they have conversation? How can you make it not too formal? What what does that, because they haven't got time. You haven't got time. We've got to feed the animals. Someone comes in, if someone's sick, that means less of us to do the job and helping them find creative way of having this conversation whereby it's not a chore. 
Um, on Thursday, I could be meeting with all the HR um, managers across Thailand, Philippines, looking at their learning needs and identifying their team. And, and then on Friday, I could be coaching a director of one of the international offices or someone local. Do you thrive on, on variety? I thrive on variety. I cannot stand boredom. I can't stand boredom. But sometimes, yeah. Uh, and also, I, I thrive on it because I think it also increases, increases your skills skills and, and strength. So this, I've talked about the lovely ones and the exciting ones. There's some others that, you, oh, when there's a data, you have to create the data of mandatory training. I mean, you can imagine how many mandatory training we have to go from ladders or using hand tools to, to even firearms training because, you know, we have... In case an animal escapes, you have to have trained firearm people and you have to get the stats that you have to send to Exco to see, you know, the attendance rate. That I find boring, but <laughs> it still has to be done, you know, and you have meeting with the health and safety manager who's saying, when do we still won't pass, uh, you know, we're not compliant. We have to get more people varied. So I can't, I don't have a typical. <laughs> what do you enjoy most about OD? Being able to to watch things turn around. We can actually make, make help people make sense of things and make change happen. But make change happen not because not you know when we talk of transaction and transformational, that's that's what I, I always try to help people to see the difference is that perhaps you've been managing people in a transactional way and that's why is do this is and, and that won't bring the change. So I want to find something juicy is helping people make sense of things for change, getting the reason behind why something is failing or I suddenly say it's succeeding. It's, it, I find that's what I find most useful working with people. So whether it's coaching or, or working with people um, on, on, a, on, a, on a chain program like the PDR we just done, it's about sitting with people, helping them see them actually engage this new way of thinking and getting the email back saying, wow, when did this actually make more sense? I'm not as stressed as the end of year when I have to write this, sell myself on a paper, you know, but now it's quarterly. I just look at this in chunks, you know, and then bite, you know, we talk about um, agile and that's what I call about being juicy. So be able to say, yes, you see, you see, this is what I'm trying to tell you that if you do it and break it down in bite sizes, it's easier to understand. So, so that's what excited me, excites me about OG, looking at things, when you talk about looking at things at like complexity is about helping people see that, um, joining things together. So like when, when I'm working with managers, I'm saying, looking at um, challenges um, they face and or, or whatever, I use the law, I think it's Stephen Covey that talks about the circle of influence and the circle of um, of concern. And that's one thing I think is also part of the OD lens to say, look, what is within your circle of concern that you can't help? I and mean, then which one falls in that circle of influence? And when we work with a circle of influence, we do what we can do, you know, and working with people is looking at that and looking at the that chunk of, you know, thing they can't digest. It's hard to understand, hard to get on with and be able to, to, to decide which ones is that's within my um my control and, and influence. So those are the kind of things I find what once you see that, you know, that shift in people's minds and light bulb moments that that I think OD OD brings. Um, skills brings a life rather than just training and development or learning and development. What do you find most challenging in your work? Oh, I think we talk about emerging, we talk about planned, we talk about the fact of give, having people given space for people to make sense of things. And, you know, we talk of um, in action, on action. We talk, it's about the time that's not available for people to do that. And so you end up being not careful joining a transaction or way of doing things and it's about organizational structures and it's about um rolling out policies and stuff like that especially when you sit in hr and trying to say look let's let's hold on can we try this a bit can we can we see if this works or not that we haven't got the time so that that itself um is i find frustrating and knowing that most of these things so we say it's it's a marathon not a sprint but most requests is expected in as a sprint. When you look back at your career so far, what would you say were some of the biggest lessons you've learned? I think the first thing is you trust the process. I mean, there's so many times you 
you know, you're, you're scared, you things don't look as if they're working on paper. Um, you go into a coaching conversation or a coaching relationship and just like, this is, I don't know where this goes, you know. And then at the end, when you reflect on it, you're like, oh, wasn't that bad? Or the feedback you get, you know, shows that it actually was more impactful than you thought. So trust the process. If you've got the skills, I, you, know, you never have to be complete, you know. So um, trust the process. Relationship building is vital. So we talk about stakeholder, stakeholder engagement, but it's vital, especially for me when I came to an organization that don't hold it differently and having people who are so skilled technically, I mean, professors, doctors, the zookeeper's knowledge is impeccable, you know, about their species and their specialists in hedgehog and specialists in this. So relationship building is, is whether it's planned or emergent intervention you want to put in place is, is vital, is necessary to avoid OD jargons. That itself can be a barrier. So how do you... <laughs> How do you sound normal? <laughs> I think, yeah. <laughs> um, especially when you're working with scientists and, and research and you're using um, frameworks and, uh, and, and models and then they ask questions that you're like, where's that question coming from? But that's because of what you're reading or what they interpreted the word you thought nobody has ever picked up with, picked up on. Learning and development. Mm. You know, you've invested in your own, you've done your MSc. What are you, how are you investing in your own learning and development now? What does that look like for you? I, I said I do a lot of I like reading and so doing research. I belong to quite a number of community of practices and networks, and I have no problem investing in my both time and energy in my development. Um, last year I joined a six weeks six weeks course at Stanford University in America. It was one a.m. to three a.m. our time. <laughs> you are dedicated. <laughs> Every time I turned up, the other classmen were like, you made it again for the six <laughs> for the six weeks it was on organizational culture and and you know, but it's an area that interests me. If I'm interested, I don't I don't mind, I don't care. So it was that's one ex- it's an extreme, but yeah. Um I'll go to bed at 10, put my alarm on and an alarm on and I'm open one to three, did all the exercise exercises. The only thing is I only have coffee breaks. I'll have to have water. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, you're not going back to sleep, are you? <laughs> so I can't I can imagine having coffee at 2 a.m. in the morning. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And I have quite a number of mentors in the field. I have no problem asking questions or approaching people for help. How do you find a good mentor? People I've worked with. Um, I think the people, it, which is why it's difficult to get a coach. Because, you know, you, there's so many coaches out there. So it's the same thing as mental. I know that we've got we've got um, organizations that do mental and mentee um, pairing and stuff. But it's also in trust. Basically, you can, I can, to your questions, trust of people I've worked with, people I look up to, people I've read up to, I've read about. I mean, there's somebody, his name has just gone off my head now, isn't what is... One of it, I think, is the chair of the OD and OD America or something. Was, and I, I don't know. I ran into something he he wrote, and I just linked him on on LinkedIn, thinking, oh, this kind of people never return, um, you know, a message, and he did. And I said, hey, I'm working on this. Then I was in House of Commons. I'm working on this project. I ran into this, but it wasn't complete. Your paper I found wasn't complete. He emailed me his whole. He's a he's a PhD lecturer. His whole lecture notes, his whole, you know, the deck of his, his, his presentation deck, everything, hundreds of pages. So, <laughs> which I still have. So, yeah, um, a lot of people are approachable than you think they'll be. So a little bit of courage, a little bit of assertiveness. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Find a really good mentor. You mentioned you really like reading. Is there a particular book that stands out that you've read Um as part of your OD journey that you'd like to recommend to other people? Uh, hmm. An OD journey. So this, this particular one is not from the OD journey. Oh, it is. And that's, you know, that seven habits of highly effective people mm. is old. I think I read it as a teenager. But it's something that's still stuck in my mind because all the principles still relate. Save from how, how do you get a win-win, you know? It's a major thing. I still use one of the managers um, program um, discussion I had recently with some 
uh, managers who talks about, well, but yeah, when you get people, um, we're all specialists in our areas. And this is within one team. Specialist one's a marine biologist, marine biologist, one is perhaps into some other form, and they're all value driven, they're all um, passion driven. And so when it comes to strategy and things like that, everybody wants a voice. And that came to my head. I'm like, the word is win win. What does it mean to have a, 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 a team charter that we work with in order to us to say, this is how we're going to talk to each other? And, and we can agree to disagree. So back to your question, some of these books are, were not originally written for OD, but you can get as as as, as same uh, um, um, results from them. And then last question, and we really want to ask this because we want to inspire the next generation of OD practitioners, whether they're in-house or consultants or whatever. But what advice would you give who someone's who's just starting out of their career or is just taking their first steps? To be clear, about what you want out of OD. Because OD is one discipline, if I might call it that, that is different things to different people. I've applied, I've been interested in jobs, I've seen advertised as OD, but when you go into the job description, it's org design or even pure HR masked as OD. So I think being clear about what you want out of OD, if you want that kind of generalist look, or if you want to really go deep into what does it mean, you know, complexity and all those things, which is particularly organizational development. And also mentor, I think a mentor, I, I find mentorship helpful because you learn, you learn from mentors, but also finding networks. Networks is a, a good place to learn from. So whether it's an ODN network or CIPD, OD, OD and D uh, network within the CIPD, but networks help because I, I see it as a safe place for people to develop skills. I've seen people come and say, I'm not actually in OD. I just, I've just heard about this network and join. And so when you have the breakout sessions, it's a good place to test things out, test ideas out, listen to people, ask questions. I, I don't necessarily think you need a qualification in OD to be able to do OD well. I think it's more like finding frameworks finding frameworks finding people who've done it before just trying things out well i just want to say a huge thank you bonju um it's been a really fascinating discussion well, you, you described it in a really articulate and really accessible way as well. And when I take my six-year-old round London Zoo, I will never look at it in the same way again, <laughs> because now I know all the magic that happens behind the scenes as well. So um, a huge thank you for being really generous with all your insights and expertise. Um, Danny, what are you taking away from today's conversation? I scribbled down lots of things as I was going, but I think a couple of things, I'm taken back to the thing you said right at the beginning about organisations being human and not a machine and the importance of kind of seeing each other as humans as kind of a, a fundamental principle of what we do. I love what you said about variety being an enabler of skills and strength and really helping us do that. The, the, the importance of holding space for to make sure we're just not focused on being transactional and just holding the space to enable us to think more more clearly and trusting the process as well. I think we've all been in that situation where we're just impatient to see, yes. see change and it's not working and then you kind of reflect back a month later or six months later and go no there was change happening you just yeah. need to trust the process so so impatient aren't they um <laughs> really yeah for me like ditto on the humanizing taking time to do that detaching ourselves from our titles and particularly in an environment where you know, these people have worked really hard to become a doctor yeah. It's, it's well, part of their identity, isn't it? And it's it, the, with it comes status. So tending to that as well. Um, I love what you said about marathon versus sprint. The fact that it is a marathon, but everything is presented to you as a sprint. So it's a very seductive invitation saying, please join the, the hamster wheel of madness here. Um, and a message really encouraging everyone to take away who's watching it today, no matter where you are in your journey in OD, is just the importance of being bold and being courageous and asking people to be mentors. The OD profession is, is really generous and people do pay it forward because we've all been there asking for help ourselves to get us through. So I think it's been a really timely reminder of the importance of that. And I love what you're saying about networks as well. 
So, so thank you. Bonjour, you, you join our, our wonderful and growing portfolio of brilliant guests. Depending on when you're watching this episode, uh, you're now the 39th expert from around the world we've, we've interviewed, and you're a very, very welcome addition to the collection. Um, if, this is, if this is the first time you're watching this podcast, we do put podcasts out almost every single week, either in audio or on video. So please do support the channel press like if you've enjoyed it please comment we'd love to hear your feedback and most importantly if you can subscribe as well so then you're kept up to date with all the latest videos and interviews and then you can get perspectives from people like Bonju creating meaningful and significant change in incredibly interesting organizations and contexts as well so so thank you everyone very much for joining us everyone and Bonju just a, a huge heartfelt thank you and thank you for making time on a Friday afternoon thank you I've enjoyed this it's been really lovely thank you fabulous thank you thank you